All right, uh, how is everybody today? You have a good conference so far? No? Yeah? Okay. Who's had a good conference? Who's had a bad conference? Who has lost the ability to raise their hand? Yeah, that's, that's what I thought. All right, so I'm Sebastian. I've been doing um, RESTful services or RESTful APIs or RESTful architectures, as is the correct uh, term, since 2003. It's been a while. It means I'm one of those speakers that is continuously talking exactly about the same stuff that he was talking about 15 years ago. Nevertheless, um, we built a whole bunch of cool stuff based on the fundamentals of uh, RESTful architectures mixed with microservices and all the buzzwords that you want. Uh, and I'm going to show you a bunch of the things that we use. Um, the, the goal of RESTful architectures is to sustain long amounts of time, right? The web uh, HTML2 that was available in the late 90s, you can still use your browser and go to it. Uh, the web as it exists is the biggest and longest serving distributed system in the world, uh, I believe. So our APIs don't do that, right? Who has a versioning identifier on their API? Like a V1, V2, V3. Okay, how many of you did more than a V1? Yeah, so uh, breaking people that want to give you money is not a good idea in general. If you have a business, you tend to want your customers not to stop using your solution. So uh, refer to one of my talks called Versioning is Evil for more details. Uh, we wanted to build an API that from the moment we built it to the moment uh, we sell the company, I hope, uh, or the business uh, goes well enough that I retire. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, we wanted it to not change and to not break so that customers could continue using what they built once. And that was it. So we chose a bunch of technologies uh, to build those hypermedia APIs. The interesting one is JSON-LD. Uh, is anyone using JSON LD here? That's one more than usual. <laughs> it's one person, for those of you that don't see the room, it's one more than, than usual. So JSON LD uh, is uh, a, an extension on JSON. Still, it's still valid JSON, but it adds a whole bunch of features on top of it, which are very useful for building serendipity inside your APIs. Your JSON document is going to be associated with a context file. I won't go into details of what it is, but more or less, it just, it's an external schema of what the things in your JSON mean. And that spec is fairly old, and it's using a fairly old data model. And when I say old, it's not a bad thing. It's a very well-known technology um, for doing schemas way before the other schema languages uh, came along on JSON. And it defines a bunch of things that are very easy to understand, right? I have a little JSON document, and it's a postal address. When Fresh, uh, the business uh, we built this API for, is selling you data about UK property, right? The color of your, the, the kind of roof tiles you have, and how far you are from trees, and how dangerous it is to sell you insurance. That's what we do. Uh, whenever you retrieve the information about your own house, Right, we have an at ID, that's pretty simple, right? That's just the URI of the current object. Pretty simple. It gives links to JSON because we decided the new interchange format should have no native data types for URIs or dates because that made a lot of sense. That was a good joke, you should be laughing. Then it has a type system on top of it. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with a detail, but a type system is a type system, right? Everybody understands what a class is. There are some differences between languages, but more or less, it's the definition of what is inside that JSON object. And then it allows you to start adding properties to your objects that themselves can be typed. So here we have a key, and it's a string, and it looks like JSON, it smells like JSON, but it doesn't necessarily need to, to, um, to stay the same. Behind the scene, we have a little bit of code like this, right? We map, but this is C-sharp code. This is a client that we're going to open source very soon. But we map our postal address class, and we say, well, that key property, it's actually that expanded URI. And that expanded URI, you can see the little key thing at the end. 
after the slash, that goes with uh, the key property that's here. So the context document is a glorified XML namespace specification. So don't run away. And I can see young, some young faces asking me, what the heck is an XML namespace? Um, this is what we spent uh, 20 years uh, wasting our time on in the industry before we did JSON. So, uh, but it's better than namespaces because you only have one declaration at the top and it allows you to mix and match languages and to define that the key property is actually the URI you can see here. It allows you to then have a level of indirection. Because how many of you change APIs just because you don't like the property name and you want to change it? Anyone? Yeah. Or you have an avatar underscore URI and you decide you're going to break compatibility because what you really want is an av avatar property and then you're going to put the URI in it. I'm not mentioning anyone GitHub. Um, that kind of breaking changes just because of syntactic sugar is actually very costly for your customers. It breaks stuff. The advantage of JSON-LD is the meaning of that property is actually defined by the context, which means I could change the key to address key if I want to. The serializer and deserializer that reads that data will not care. You just, used to have, to, uh, you just have to use a JSON-LD parser, and magically, I can change the JSON format without actually changing the vocabularies behind them. So my code doesn't break in the face of changes. I think that's pretty cool. I can see faces of people not understanding at all why I'm saying that. But just imagine if you remove the version identifier and you have an architect like me telling you no, no versions, ever. Well, this stuff is pretty useful because you can improve the JSON format and resist to change because your clients will not break as you evolve and refine what shape of the API is. And then it introduced relationships, which sounds like a very, very complicated thing because uh, people like throwing scientific terms like direct, uh, what is it, directed acyclic graphs and stuff like that. Yeah, it's just, there's a bunch of no's and arrows. That's, you know, boxes and arrows. I think we can all deal with boxes and arrows, right? So we have the postal address, and we don't give personal information on our API for ethical reasons. But if we did, if we did, the person type has a name property, and the relationship between postal address and person is the owner. I won't surprise you to tell you that the owner also expands to a full URI, uh, so that it also doesn't break. But the interesting thing is you can have an object, and sub-objects have relationships embedded into the JSON. The same relationship that you can put into a link header. Anyone knows the web linking specification? This is how you link stuff on the web. Or if you're more old school, the link tag in HTML. Right, is it better? No one uses the link tag? Come on, link tags are cool. So we chose JSON-LD because it gives us all these capabilities to resist any change that is on the wire so that we can continue charging customers and they can continue being happy and we can continue getting money. Happiness, money, good. Then we started uh, modeling other things on top of that, and we started using Hydra. And this is where, really, we start adding all the hypermedia to the API. The goal of not breaking the customers and making sure they can rewrite the code is to make sure we add levels of indirection. That's how you build stuff, so that it doesn't break. You break the thing in the middle, you don't break the customers. In a static, closed view of the world, every single one of your services has one static schema that is namespace to that little service. Then you have a 1,000 services and you have a 1,000 schemas, 1,000 ways of interacting with the service, 1,000 data types, and they are all completely independent. Because you want to know exactly, at build time, the full schema of everything that happens so you can code generate. Who's using a code generator for client APIs? Yeah, that stuff breaks a lot. I don't know if you've noticed, it breaks a lot, right? But I know the industry has settled on this since SOAP. So nothing new there. But the problem with doing all this code generation is this stuff will break. So we don't like breaking. So we want instead to use links and forms to navigate the API. And we want to make sure that the customers can use that. So the first thing is iterating over large data sets. We need collections for that. And that's where we're going to try to get to demos a little bit. Uh, Tell me when I'm approaching, because I, I will talk for hours and I know everybody's hungry. Um, 
So I'll just go very quickly over what we actually do. I don't know if my access token is still valid, so we'll see. No, it's not valid. Okay, so we use OAuth for authentication with OpenID Connect and some custom extensions to make it all automatic. Uh, not going to bother you with the details of that. It's not particularly interested. Oh yeah, internet might be useful for demos, eh? Yeah. Okay, well, I'll do a little dance while we try to connect. Um, we, uh, we use collections because paged collections are kind of a fundamental thing on the internet, and yet there are very few specifications actually covering how you navigate from one page to the other and navigate through the whole thing. We have about 12 standards now. So we saw that in Hydra, and we thought, eh, you know what, we need to solve 12 schemas with a 13th schema uh, for collections. That was also a joke. I, did. I need someone that has a little sign, you know, like, like in the 60s in the movie saying, please laugh. Okay, so I have, I have my token here. We're going to do this baby here. And then we're going to purchase stuff. We're going to ignore that for now, and we're going to go straight to the catalogs. I'll cover all this stuff in two minutes. I swear to God I will not go too far down the road of explaining everything in excruciating detail. This is a Hydro collection, and TLDR, this is saying, oh, this is a collection of postal addresses. We basically say that every single thing that is in that, in that uh, collection has a type of postal address. Apologies for the weird syntax. It's RDF. It's not my fault. Uh, <laughs> I don't, this, the syntax is, is what it is. It's a standard. Uh, but uh, it allows you to have all the member elements, and there's a relationship between the collection and its members, of course. But it also allows you to page. It gives you the first page, the next page, the last page. So when you automate your software, you can go and either retrieve all the results in one go or keep on enumerating until you get everything you like. Pretty useful type. We also use, and that's, that's where it becomes more interesting. We also want customers to be able to point a generic client at our API and discover automatically where they can figure out where a postal address is, or a postcode, or a person. And we can do that because we document entry points, which I believe are here. Is it? Can you see at the back well? Yes? OK, so an entry point is giving you, for example, here, you can see that you can go and search postal addresses by putting a postcode inside a URI template. So we can expose all the links uh, that exist in the system, how to query collections, how to find different elements in your API based on a self-descriptive format that you can read at runtime. So that you can have one thing that knows about postal address and can go as many APIs as it wants. That allows the system to navigate itself. You could click around it if we had a good console, which we're starting to have uh, with a little tool called the generic Hydro console. I invite you because we're short for time to go and try it out. It's cool. Um, on top of that, we then need to have operations. And operations, I think I put the code in there to save a bit of time. Da -da -da. Da -da -da. No, it's not there. It's in the schema. No worries. OK, so then we have the schema. And the schema is actually quite de declarative, and there's a lot of data in there. And I can see here that my postal address, I can describe every single one of the properties that exist. It's a schema language. I know it's very boring for you, but it's quite fun for me. Um, and it allows you to reuse vocabularies from, from outside. right? So why you create your own name property with your own documentation that you have to write when schema.org already did all the hard work? I don't like writing. Who likes writing documentation? Right, I have jobs for you because we need, we need good documentation writers. Um, this stuff addresses the majority of the problems we have because you just point at saying, oh, well, this is a schema.org name. So pull in the documentation dynamically and just put it in your UI and pretend you wrote it. It saves you a huge amount of time. It's brilliant. And then we can go further, and this is where we have the forms. So we have the links, we can discover them, we can figure out how to get an address from postcode, that's all really cool. And then we can go and purchase stuff, which is the interesting thing uh, in, uh, in the entrepreneurial side of me, right? It's where I can charge people. And here I can define that um, the catalog resource type has a purchase variable action. It's 
a description of how you purchase a variable. And I can say, well, to be able to purchase a variable, I'm going to tell you exactly how to craft the HTTP request. So your client doesn't have to know in advance the schema and the format and what's going to put in all that or where to post it. It's just going to tell you, well, figure out where purchase variable is and then fill in the HTTP request the way I tell you to. So the server is back into control of navigating the client through interacting with me, my API. That means that if I have one server currently that does all the purchase and I want people to suddenly start querying or purchasing on other servers, even dynamically if I want to, because the client is just reading this dynamically, I can do whatever I want. I can change the schema of how the data is being sent. The client is generic, he doesn't care. And because it's very difficult to actually break your client. And I'll finish with uh, where it becomes very interesting. The previous talk was great because we, uh, we built an API gateway too. And it's really cool. But it's based on, the, uh, on this idea of an open-ended uh, model. In an open-ended model, you will never know what's in your object. You just have a very partial view of the schema that exists. I know that in that part of my code, postal address has a key property. But in that part of the code, it has a name or a country code. They're two independent services, probably built by different people that don't like talking to one another. We like talking to everyone in the company because we're great people, but I know that some companies don't have that benefit. So what we've created is a microservice infrastructure where we have so much metadata about how we build a system that whenever a service spins up, it feeds in a whole bunch of information about the view it has of the class, the operations it supports. The API gateway doesn't need any registration. It just gets notified, oh, there's new links you need to dispatch. So we do versioning, canary releases, environment, preview and live, and it's all automatically and transparently happening in the background without us having to update anything. Spin up a service, boom, it's available on the API. I won't do it on our live systems or, um, you know, don't want to break stuff while I can't fix stuff. But I could. And what we end up with is our schema of the API that we use is a combination, an overlay of every single definition that exists in every single of the microservices we use. That allows us to have very specialized microservices that may not even know that they have links to another system, right? Postal address and country. Postal address might not know about country whatsoever, but we'll still generate all the links, which is also very cool. And we build a whole system like that, and we build the whole API gateway, and we did that uh, not by crafting a whole bunch of stuff by hand, uh, but through a tool that is called Open Raster. Uh, that I encourage you to uh, go and check out if you're a .NET developer. No, it's not dead. Yes, it's 12 years old, but it's a great code base in some places. Uh, and it generates all of this format for you from three lines of code. So that's pretty useful. It gives you a hypermedia nearly for free, which is the hardest bit of REST that people have difficulties doing. And we're coming out with a client, which I hoped I could actually publish today. And Unfortunately, I didn't manage to finish all the things I wanted to put in it, but it's coming up very, very quickly. Uh, check out a bunch of things like schema.org to see what sharing languages uh, is useful for and to steal their documentation uh, when you write yours. It's pretty useful. Uh, there's a bunch of hypermedia clients that support Hydra now uh, in different formats. There's, uh, I'll, I'll, I, don't, I can't pronounce it. How do you pronounce it? Alcius, Alcius and Heracles uh, for TypeScript that will allow you to implement all this hypermedia without all the pain that usually comes with it. And if you have any questions, don't try to email me because I'm terrible at emails. Uh, you can, however, come to the HTTP API Slack. I highly recommend it, and it has nothing to do with me being the founder. Uh, but it's a, it's a vendor neutral place to talk about anything HTTP and I'm on there all the time and a bunch of people that are here today are on there on the, all the time. So don't hesitate to, uh, to come and chat, uh, give your opinion. We even have a GraphQL room. All right, any questions before we go for food? Do we have time for questions? Okay, uh, so uh, I wanted to ask you, because uh, you're on the developer side and you use JSON-LD and Hydra and this cool new stuff and it's all very exciting. But did you have any problems with uh, the clients that they have to, because 
when you uh, expose uh, a documentation or an API using JSON-LD and Hydra and stuff like that, then you need to have the developers who are your clients that they can consume that. And I've seen at my company some problems with that, actually. Yeah, so it's, the, yes, there's, there's always a little bit of, a, it's always been the problem with hypermedia. I think the state of clients until recently was pathetically bad because everybody spent 10 years building server rest but not client rest, which is kind of essential. But it's getting better. I think we, I know we used to say that about SOAP in 2002, 2003, but really no one should be, rewri no one should be rewriting their own HTTP stack so why do we think that people can continuously write their own HTTP clients to do stuff? It's going to break. If you want to embed inside stuff to not break, then reuse an existing library. You can't just use HTTP. It's cool to hack shit together. But, you know, architecture is, uh, is a balancing act. If I want to support stuff for 10 years, I can't let people hack straight on JSON. That said... <laughs> Once customers have decided on their own view of the contract, you're kind of stuck. But one of the benefits of this thing is if I have people that bind themselves to that specific JSON structure, uh, in the future, I can have a, the, the gateway convert to a previous format just based on the graph I just sent back. So I know my postal address and all the properties that exist, but if someone had decided to try and hack together how they access the JSON object, well, if it breaks, they'll call me pretty quickly. And we can just put a little translation just for that customers and then encourage them strongly for a better SLA to go and use a generic client. Usually better SLA is what gets them interested. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult to get customers to want to do that. So you provide an SDK and you use the generic client to sell. That's what we do on .NET. Check out our NuGet package uh, for the WinFresh client if you're interested in UK property data. But uh, that's what we do behind the scenes.